Assalamu alaikum everyone. You are listening to episode 54 of the Muhammad Ghailan podcast with yours truly as the host. Back fresh from a trip to Sydney. Um, this was my second trip to Sydney. And uh, the first one was last year with the UNSW MSA. Shout out to the MSA at UNSW where I went there and had a, a, a very fascinating discussion with uh, Peter Slezak, the philosopher of science, and uh, gave a couple of talks afterwards, uh, the next day there. And uh, the recordings, you can find them on my YouTube channel, uh, if you haven't seen that. This time around, I was invited by Mizan Avenue. And um, it's funny with these things, when I get these invites, I, I look forward to meeting people, and I, I enjoy personal interaction more than I do when it, uh, with the online stuff, to be honest with you. Um, there's something that gets transmitted with the human connection, the human-to-human -human connection in physical in the physical world that gets lost in the, in the online world. I mean, depending on whatever estimates that you come across, 87 or 93% or whatever, of communication being nonverbal, that basically tells you the majority of your communication is, is just nonverbal. It's, it's your presence. And the very min minimal part of communication has to do with the actual words. And from my experience, I can go back and forth with somebody over email for days. And still, I can still sense from their, from their responses that they still haven't, they don't feel settled. But in person, totally different story. I can have with you, I can sit with you from five minutes to six hours, but I know that Typically, within a single session of just a single session of just hanging out and just talking about something, we can get it done. We can settle it, and so and and that's because there's something else that gets transmitted that you just don't you you miss out on on the online world. So I, I really enjoy these um, uh, these gatherings when I get invited to them and I go and I teach or give a talk or whatever. Uh, this time around, you know, I treated it just like any other invite. You know, inshallah, I'll come and give this talk and see the, see the people. And I didn't really have any expectations. I didn't know what kind of a venue it was. Um, I tried looking them up online to see some pictures. And so I, I, w I went in blind with this. And the only reason I went in is because um, I knew somebody who taught with, uh, with Mizan Avenue who I trusted. You know, I always try to vet the organization because you could be guilty by association. And so there was this uh, Aftab Malik, he, t he taught uh, the group there. And so I was like, all right, I trust Aftab, you know, and so I'm going to go and do it. And I have to say, uh, to this moment right now, I'm, I'm back home. I'm still trying to process the experience that I had because I can't describe it as anything but uh, an expansive spiritual experience. You can sense... Let me give you an analogy. Maybe this will help you a little bit to get what I'm, I'm trying to relate here about Mizan Avenue. If you go to a masjid that is built last year and you go to another masjid, another mosque that has been around for a thousand years, there is a, a qualitative difference that you can sense if you're paying attention to your internal state. There is a qualitative difference when you enter into the mosque that is a thousand years old versus a mosque that is a year old. And that qualitative difference has to do with the fact that in a mosque that is a thousand years old, you're entering into a place that has had such spiritual buildup from all the generations upon generations of people that have made sujood there, that have prayed there, that have recited Quran there, that have done qiyam there, they prayed taraweeh there. There's so much that has been happening in that masjid for, for a thousand years. There's a buildup of spirituality that the other masjid that's a year old just doesn't have. So you'll feel spiritual, you'll feel a sense of presence, it's nice in the masjid, the new, in the new masjid, but it's just not the same. There's something unique about a masjid that is a thousand years old. Now, when it comes to newer organizations and buildings and settings and venues and things that you go to, that internal state, depending on the intentions of the people that are running it and the people that are putting it together, that will generate an intern that will generate an impact upon your internal state when you go in there. If their intentions are about we want to bring people closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to have people increase in their love to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If their work is about that, number one, it will manifest in the way that they set everything up. Because they're trying to do things with ihsan. And number two, because of the intention, you'll start to feel it when you enter in, into this venue. And 
you know, Allah says, oh, لا تزكوا أنفسكم هو علم من التقى. Do not exalt yourselves and purify yourselves. Allah knows who best who has taqwa. But we judge by the external. As the Messenger of Allah said, I was commanded to command by the external facts that I have in front of me, and Allah will take care of the internal states. Based on the external, which really should indicate your internal state, I really, uh, there's something unique and special about Mizan Avenue um, that I really, I, I implore the the team to continue renewing their intentions because it's just, a, it's just, it's, it's so special. There's something spiritually uplifting about that place. And I believe it has to do with the sincerity of the of the team. Um, you know, Malik, Abdul Rahman, Asma, Zubaydah, uh, Shakira, uh, Ramana, um, I, I highly, highly recommend for anybody that's in Sydney, check out Mizan Avenue and uh, look into their programs. It's a special place. And I, I hope that uh, I get the, uh, Allah opens up another door for me to come and, even if it's just to come and just sit there. Um, that's how special of a place it is. And FYI, anytime you ever hear me in this podcast or see me post anything about anybody or any organization, the plug that I'm doing is generated from within me. I do get requests sometimes from people to advertise with something. I, I always refuse. This podcast is advertisement free and I don't give plugs for anyone except if I believe in their work. They never ask. So with Mizan Avenue, then I'm sure any of them that are listening are going to be surprised that I'm mentioning, I'm saying all of these things about it. It's, it's such a wonderful place. So that's with Mizan Avenue. And the talk that I gave there, it is recorded. The recording should be available hopefully soon, inshallah. Um, uh, once it gets processed. So that's Mizan Avenue. Highly recommend you guys check it out. Uh, before I get into the subject matter for this podcast, though, um, a quick reminder. At the time of recording this podcast, it's uh, Sha'ban the 5th. So we got about 25 days or 24 days left before Ramadan enters. A blessed guest with a blessed time. And... What I've been doing, I'm going to share with you what I, what I do, just so that for the sake of those of you who, you know, remind, for reminder will benefit the believers. Um, I started, I switched, I, I'm recording this now, I just got back from the gym. And it's 10.45 p.m., it's late. Those of you who've been following and listening to the, my stuff previously, you know that I work out usually at 5.30 a.m., you know, or 6 a.m. at the latest time at the gym. I'm a I'm an early riser, um, and I go work out in the morning after I finish my subah and my awrad and all of these things. You know, you get your spiritual workout done, and then you go and do your physical workout. So I usually work out in the morning. Now it takes your body about three weeks for your hormonal regulation. If you're going to change anything with your circadian rhythm, uh, your if you're going to change your eating habits, it takes you know a couple of weeks for it to adjust. And that's why when Ramadan enters. The way that most people treat Ramadan is they live their lives as they do all the way till the very end. And then they expect to do, they do this 180 degree switch, basically, at a, at a physical level. And they struggle for the first month, uh, the first week of the month. Now, the month, you know, got four weeks of it. That's 25% of the month wasted in you just adjusting. Your body just adjusting and getting used to different eating habits. Uh, those of you who work out, adjusting to the different demands because now your caloric intake is reduced and it's happening at different times than you're used to. And if you're going to switch your workout time, it's all these things. So what you, you know, the Sahaba used to prepare for Ramadan six months in advance. I'm just asking you to do this now about you know three weeks in advance because that's how much time it will take for your body to adjust and adapt. Personally, what I do, I have an eating window that goes from 8 to 3 or 9 to 4 usually, intermittent fasting. So I, I stop eating at 3 p.m., 4 p.m. at the latest, and then there's no more food. Um, my workout is in the morning. So all that is going to have to change. And I don't want to spend the first week, week and a half of Ramadan struggling with my body just so that it can adapt to the change. So over the next three to four weeks until Ramadan enters basically, I've, I'm switching everything around. My workouts are going to be at night. My eating window is going to be moved throughout the day slowly so that I can now, uh, so then I can finally get used to having an eating window that is more in the evening as opposed to in the daytime because when you fast, sunrise to sunset. 
I'm basically preparing my body, my physiology, so that by the time Ramadan enters, I don't have to deal with it anymore. And then I can up the ante at the spiritual. And then you also incorporate, you know, you add some additional things that you do to your religious ritual practices that you may not have been doing before. Uh, those of you who, you know, you don't recite the Quran that often, you start to recite it more often. So that when the time comes and Ramadan enters, you're already you already have a rhythm going and all you have to do now is just up it up. It's a lot easier for you to increase the dose and to up the ante when you already have a, a rhythm going than to begin something from scratch. So I highly recommend you just begin from now. Do something so that you can make make the necessary adjustments so that you don't have to worry about your uh, uh, physiological adaptations happening in the first week of the of the month. And that way you will get the most out of the month. Out. You know, it's... um. It's a blessed time. You should really, and it's limited, and it f goes by really quickly. So you want to get the most out of it that you can uh, and take the most advantage of it and, and benefit from it as much as possible. So that's putting that aside now. Uh, I published an article in March 26th, on March 26th in Iman Wire, at Medina Institute, uh, Blind Faith in Intellectual Circles. And what I wanted to do in this episode is uh, just go through that article uh, for those of you who haven't read it or just don't have the time to, to read it and prefer to listen to a podcast, and in wherever places uh, that require some commentary, I'll add some commentary to clarify, um, uh, just for the benefit of those who read it and maybe have some questions that I can address that way. Uh, it is difficult to describe the current intellectual milieu, especially in academic settings, as anything but totalitarian. The illusion of debates and disagreements can quickly be dissipated once it is realized that these apparent differences are not really all that significant since they all rely on a shared agreement between the interlocutors. To put it plainly, everyone must accept the notion of a transcendent source determining the moral value of actions and their, impl and their implications is to be rejected out of hand. Terms like morality, ethics, good or evil are vestiges of a bygone era of belief in God and revelation. Today, they are used while assuming their metaphysical significance within a paradigm that negates it. Yet, despite the indefatigable attempts to get rid of God and religion, materialists have failed, and quite miserably, if I might add, to get rid of these concepts. The reason for that lies in these categories being part of the fitrah. They are part of what it means to be human as opposed to a member of Homo sapiens. The nature made by God in which he has made humans. There is no altering of God's creation. That is the right religion, but most people do not know. Still, the connection with the divine has been severed, and humanity has ever since been wandering into an abyss of self-destruction and doing so in mad celebratory jubilation. Frederick Nietzsche's commentary on the implication of our post-God state in his uh, book, The Gay Science, is one of the most troubling passages ever written. Nietzsche writes, Haven't you heard of that madman who is in the bright morning lit a lantern and ran to the marketplace crying incessantly, I'm looking for God, I'm looking for God. Since many of those who did not believe in God were standing together just then, he caused great laughter. Has he been lost then? asked one. Did he lose his way like a child? asked another. Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone to sea? Immigrated? Thus they shouted and laughed, one interrupting the other. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Where is God? he cried. I'll tell you, we have killed him. You and I, we are all his murderers. But how do we do this? How did we do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained the earth from its sun? Where is it moving to now? Where are we moving to? Away from all suns? Are we not continually falling and backwards, sidewards, forwards, in all directions? Is there still an up and a down? Aren't we straying as though through an infinite nothing? Isn't empty space breathing at us? Hasn't it got colder? 
Isn't night and more night coming again and again? Don't lanterns have to be lit in the morning? Do we still hear nothing of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we still smell nothing of the divine decomposition? Gods too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How can we console ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? The holiest and the mightiest thing the world has ever possessed has blood to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood from us? With what water could we clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement? What holy games will we have to invent for ourselves? Is the magnitude of this deed not too great for us? Do we not ourselves have to become gods merely to appear worthy of it? There were never a greater deed, and whoever is born after us will on account of this deed belong to a higher history than all history up to now. Well, God is not dead, as he did not begin to exist for him to end. What we did, and the thing that we killed, was our own selves. And the stench of the, the decomposition that Nietzsche is pointing to is coming from us. The historical events underlying the philosophical and scientific developments during the 17th and 18th century in Europe gave us a false sense of independence as we forgot the simple fact that our existence, indeed all of material existence, is by definition contingent. We told ourselves the biggest lie ever concocted and unprecedented by any past human civilization, that God is a hypothesis we have no need for. To describe the inheritance of this legacy and the way it manifests itself in academia as totalitarian is befitting. By removing a transcendent source to determine truth from falsehood, we have no rational basis for arbitration. What we have is a power game, and those who can wield the most of it are the ones who determine what is acceptable. Rational is just code for acceptable by the establishment. It is an ephemeral category, lasting only as long as those who decided it are in power. Without God, there is no rational basis for any conclusion about anything related to how humans should or should not act. All discussions of morality and ethics in such a paradigm depend on utilitarianism, the philosophical pursuit of determining which actions will bring about the greatest good for the greatest number. It is about maximizing pleasure and reducing harm, as subjectively determined by the people involved. Utilitarianism is academic jargon for the practice of worshipping whims and desires, which are then post hoc rationalized with arguments to convince oneself of the pseudo-moral validity of the actions one partakes in. This is why the Qur'an does not mention atheism among the beliefs it argues against. Human beings are wired to obey something. The question is not whether God exists. Asking this question requires a preceding rejection of reason, which in turn ends the conversation as there will be no agreed upon principles for a rational discussion. The real question to ask is whether our worship will be directed towards God or towards idols of our own making. In the case of the materialist, the idol is one's own whims and desires. Have you seen the one who takes their own whim for their God, as the Qur'an states? Any choice made within the, cur the currently dominant naturalist paradigm cannot at bottom be rationally justified. Without God, there is no intrinsic value to anything. There is no such thing as good or evil. What we call good or evil refers to a hedonistic pursuit of pleasures. God, or good, is what materially feels good and makes material life more facil facilitated. And evil is what materially feels bad and makes material life more difficult. There is no such thing as life, as we mean the term in a metaphysical sense. What we call life are simply different aggregates of physiologically animated cells that combine in different ways to make organisms. We call cessation of that animation death, but that too has no moral significance. It just is, which makes most debates about a, about a contentious subject like abortion nonsensical. One cannot be a materialist who rejects God and simultaneously 
believe in a metaphysical force called life, either before or after conception or during gestation or even after birth. The subject of abortion requires its own treatment, but uh, the point here stands. Now, the Age of Enlightenment was a massive project in constructing the idol of the self as humans decided to become God. It was an exchange of reasons for a circumambulation around the whim. If adopting a philosophically naturalist position means we cannot ultimately offer a rational justification for anything, what should we call events promoted as debates and intellectual discussions in academia? Better yet, what should we call education in higher learning institutes? To put it bluntly, it is the professional practice of going around in intellectual circles without the prospect of ever arriving at any conclusion that one can have much confidence in. Education is the indoctrination of blind faith in this irrational practice as the straight path to human emancipation from the tests that God has made as part of our existence here, which we problematized as pain and suffering when we killed ourselves and severed our connection with Him. Indeed, the problem of evil is a narcissistic God complex that disguises itself as a philosophical conundrum. It says more about the state we have gotten ourselves to intellectually and spiritually than it does about God or religion. What ends up being called reasonable are proclamations that get popular appeal, which could and do change because this appeal is not based on reason or some fantasy about human progress. It is based on whims that can be manipulated by nothing more than the oratory skills and and a tantalizing presentation. It is interesting that when the beloved Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked who it was when, the, when he heard a knock on the door and a man replied, it's me, he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, retorted, me, me, indicating that he hated it. Now, the reason for writing this article, it's, uh, it's just a relatively short one. Um, the reason I put this together um, is because of a lot of the discourses and the discussions that are taking place right now, especially in the activist realm, um, which I've engaged to at some small degree with regards to feminism and whatnot, but we have a lot of isms nowadays. Liberalism, feminism, uh, gender theory, critical race theory, uh, Islamophobia, um, uh, what else? There's just so much. There's like a new thing that pops up every day. And many Muslims, especially those in the activist realm, are just jumping on board and just going along with a lot of these things. There is a, a, a problem when you don't have grounding in, in basic aqidah, in basic theology, in your basic belief system. It's not sufficient for you to just claim that you're a Muslim and that you just say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah, and then use that as just, that's all I need to know, and then go and participate in all of these different um, activism movements, uh, activist movements, and just social change that is taking place without much criticism. You know, there's an interesting, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has imparted a responsibility upon Muslims. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lil nas. Ta'amuruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in Surah Al-Imran that you were the best of nations that was brought forth for the people. You command for good and you forbid evil. That's, that's the role of Muslims. And Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Al-Baqarah um, uh, Like so, we have, uh, we have made you into a middle nation so that you can become bear witnesses against or over the people, and the messenger will be a bear witness over you. He will witness over you. In other words, we are the bearers from, you know, as Muslims, we believe that we have the truth, and we have the final revelation, and we have the, 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 the correct compass to get people on the straight path. When you see people engaged in all kinds of activity, the first thing a Muslim should be doing is, first of all, questioning the merit, the validity of that activity from a revelatory source. Unfortunately, however, a lot of Muslims today have adopted identity politics 
as their revelatory source. And because of the continued scrutiny over Muslims, uh, this whole business with Islamophobia, we've picked up this identity politics and we're now engaged in the same conversations as all of these social justice movements that are engaged in, and we have basically dropped the mantle. Not realizing that in doing so, we've just basically adopted some of the gods. We've turned ourselves into the gods that Nietzsche was talking about and abandoned God and what God expects of us. There's something that needs to be uh, uh, said. Dear Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about Islam, that he will make this religion manifest over all other religions, ideologies, belief systems. He will make it manifest. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. That verily we have, most certainly we have descended this dhikr, this reminder, and we are the ones who are going to preserve it. In other words, the preservation of this dhikr, if you fail at doing your job, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do it, will do it for us. And he's not in need of us to deliver this message. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said he's going to make it manifest over all others, we have the choice that we have as Muslims is do we step up to the plate and claim the responsibility and act accordingly or do we just become another sect, engage in all of the sectarianism and all these isms that are out there and abandon this responsibility? If we do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to subject us. It's like Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. When he said, نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ فَإِنْ إِبْتَغَيْنَ الْعِزَّةَ فِي غَيْرِهِ أَذَلَّنَ اللَّهُ We are a people that have been ennobled by Islam. Allah ennobled us by Islam. If we seek nobility in anything other than Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will debase us. When you have a, a, a rational position with regards to your beliefs, and you have the guidance coming to you from the Qur'an and from the Sunnah, and that's what I tell people, and I mentioned it in the last podcast, and I'll mention it again, and I'll continue to say this till I'm blue in the face, till the cows come home. Anything that you engage in, if you want to be a rational person, um, you have to preface it with, well, Allah says, and the Messenger وسلم, says, and then you proceed. You need to have uh, an absolute source, a transcendent source, an anchor that you take off from. Much of the activism that is, I'm seeing anyways, uh, as I observe what's happening, curiously, these things are missing from it. And so what you end up doing is just going around in circles. What you feel very strongly about today, give it a year, and you'll feel very strongly against it all of a sudden because whatever social change that happened, and then you'll have a, you'll have a different opinion formed about it. That's what it means by intellectual circles. You, you, you're never settled. You, you don't have a position to take. Today you're talking about this one issue. The next day you're talking about another issue. The next year you're talking about something else. And whatever you believed a year ago, now you don't believe it anymore because, I mean, social change. People believe in different things. So now you have to go along with the thing. You have to claim your responsibility. And the way that you do that, and I keep repeating this to people, you need to study your religion. You need to connect with teachers. And you need to study basic aqidah, you need to t study basic fiqh, you need to study basic logic, and you need to also get connected with the Qur'an. And that's what the month of Ramadan is, is supposed to serve for you. It's a reconnection with the Qur'an for those of you who have not been connecting with it throughout the year. And you need to keep that connection going all year long. So that's really all I have to say about that. Um, it's without ruffling too many feathers, because I, for the past while I've been ruffling too many feathers, especially with the feminists. Um, all we're trying to do here is just try to, you know, get you to just take a pause and step back and and just get back to basics. As Ibn Atta Allah Sikandari says, Rahimahullah, Al-Bidayat, Alamatun Nihayat. The beginnings are the signs of the ends. You always have to question yourself. And the thing that I was mentioning at Mizan Avenue is, you have to keep looking at your intentions. What is your end game? What are you trying to get to? You have to remember something. Shaitan is very clever. Shaitan is not going to come to you and tell you, hey, listen, why don't you, um, uh, let's go to the bar. 
and just have a few drinks or let's go and steal something or let's go and, like shaitan is not going to come to you with these simpleton just direct commands to disobey clear cut guidelines what he does is he gets you involved in things that have some elements of truth to them but on the whole you're engaged in batil so you ask many of these activists about basic things related to intention uh, basic things regarding Islamic law, basic things that relate to their own personal affairs and personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you will hear crickets. But then you ask them about the latest and the greatest theory in critical race theory or something to do with gender and feminism or whatever, and they will just give you a whole spiel and engage in a very lengthy dialogue, and they will engage. And, you know, like I said, some of this stuff could have some validity to it, but it's packaged that, that this validity is actually just to allow a package of bottle to pers to keep to su to sustain itself cuz you won't have absolute bottle going on and so that's how the shaitan gets you talbisu iblis the deception of the devil or the deception of iblis is to get you to fall for these things where you think you're let's say seeking equality and justice and whatever but he packages it in a way where you forget that the whole thing is actually problematic you got to get back to the source before you engage in a constructive dialogue. And when you do, you have to cite your source so that you can present your case as a witness, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, uh, about that for your role. I hope this has been of some sort of benefit, maybe trigger some thoughts. I do look forward to comments and feedback. Um, I welcome that. Uh, discussions, wherever I end up uh, going, if you happen to be in the same uh, in a venue where I'm going to be speaking, you, I, I really enjoy these discussions with you guys and having a back and forth. Um, but you can send me your comments through endlessonline.org um, uh, or you can just do it through my Facebook page. And um, this is an ongoing thing. It's uh, uh, We're trying to just get, get people back into some sort of a level playing field here and remind Muslims of the responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has imparted upon us. With that, I will bid you adieu for this week. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayk.